we can we can we can find we can find ways to fill the time. I, I know. I'm sure there's people that'd be happy to just sit up here and look at you. I know. I'll be like, hey. <laughs> like. <laughs> so, Mike, um, we were talking backstage. So we're here at a comic con. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with the with the meatball pitch. Um, you're playing iconic comic character in Luke Cage. Were you a fan of the character? Were you aware of the character before you got the role? Uh, y growing up, I grew up in South Carolina, um, and we didn't have a lot of comic book stores growing up, so all of the comics that I came into contact with were predominantly given to me by my cousins from larger cities, like you know, up north, Philadelphia, um, e even in the state like Charleston, the little bigger cities that had at least one comic book store. I mean, my, my small town did not have any comic book stores, so it was definitely just whatever I could get my hands on from those guys, and um, you know, there was no Amazon, you didn't order stuff, it was just, you know, what, whatever you could find. Um, so I never came, in the, came into contact with Luke Cage, that comic book never, um, came my way, so I had heard about it later years, but I, I didn't know anything about the comic. And then um, a couple years prior to Netflix coming up with this this uh, TV series, a couple people were reaching out to me, hey, going, you know, there's this character Luke Cage. I hear they're gonna cast this character Luke Cage, and again, they were like this close family members, people who were not in the business, who would say, hey, man, you probably make a good Luke Cage, and I'm like. Well, you know, they're not in the business, so you don't <laughs> listen. You're like, of course they say this. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever, dude. Um, you know, um, and this happened to work out. So it's just one of those things, yeah. Cool. I'm also going to ask an evil question uh, before we turn over to the, to the fans here. Um, so for those of you who are not watching this show. <laughs> Siri, Siri's, uh, what was going on? Siri, Siri heard me. Yeah, something going on. Okay, go ahead. Siri, Siri is possessed. <laughs> So, preparing for this panel, I thought I should check this show out. We watched the first episode, and then I kind of caught up on them. And I thought, like, I thought I knew what to expect with this show. It's a supernatural show. It's on CBS on Thursday nights. And the more of this thing you watch, the creepier it gets. This is a really interesting show. So, tell us a little bit about the show and your character, the character that you play on it for the folks that may not have. Uh, Be familiar. So the show is called Evil. Uh, like you said, it premieres. Or he, it starts. Uh, it's already been on for like about five or six weeks. Uh, it's Thursday nights at ten o'clock. Um, the character I play is a guy who is training to be a priest. Um, uh, what's known as a seminarian. Um, works for the Catholic Church. Uh, this sounds kind of weird already, right? And he is uh, given this task of being an assessor for people who claim to be. Uh, possessed demonically, people who claim that there's some otherworldly influence that's uh, taking over them, their home, uh, a person, things of that nature. Now, my character also believes that everything that people say is not true, so he hires a psychologist or a, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist rather to help him assess people to to deal with what he, they are hearing from a scientific um, standpoint, and he also has a practical person who is good with computers. Um, and that's um, the guy who comes and he sort of kicks the tires. So with the three of us, it sounds like a setup of a procedure, but it really is a sort of disguise. It's not really a procedural. It's really more of a character-driven show disguised as a procedural. And what I mean is if he watches a show from one episode to the next, you, you know the world. You see demons sometimes. You see things that happen. We debate on whether this is uh, actually something that actually happened from a scientific standpoint or actually something spiritual. And I'm a devout um, believer, because otherwise I wouldn't be working for the Catholic Church. Um, and then I have this um, psychologist who is completely, um, at, at, at best, maybe a, a agnostic, and then the other guy's probably an atheist. But the three of us have great debates. We, we're not, the show never really judges either um, point of view. It leaves the viewer to sort of wonder and sort of try to figure it out. And it's always, I feel, like one step ahead of the audience. It is creepy. It is um, um, very intriguing. It's um, a bit disturbing at moments. Um, and, it, and it does have a science, uh, sci-fi feel to it sometimes. So it's really hard to describe the show. But if you like X-Files or Exorcist or if you like even if you like procedurals, I mean, there's really, it hits a lot of um, target audiences and um, it's well written, so, you know, check it out. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's an interesting show because it's sometimes hard to tell whether what the demons and the supernatural aspects are up to is worse than what humans just by themselves or through 
systematic injustice can do. So it's really an interesting exploration of, of sort of the dark side of things. And as you say, it's very well written, and you guys are all uh, it's terrific chemistry. Yeah, and yeah. Is, is, is it good chemistry on the set? I mean, we have great chemistry. Um, all the all the, the leads in the show, all the guest stars, everybody. We've uh, we sort of really have a good chemistry, a good vibe on set. And as he alluded to, we do deal with mostly a lot of sociopaths, psychopaths. I mean, because we we I mean, the show is called Evil, but it's it's not really on the nose. What we are dealing with are people who are obsessed with the 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 notion that there is always the potential for evil and they try to encourage it, they try to influence people to do things. We, we've already dealt with quite a few um, topics that you see in the newspapers all the time, but we deal with it on a level that's not so, again, on the nose. We sort of subversively go in another direction and allow you to sort of wonder um, what this might be like in your own life. Because I think when you watch each show, you at some point you have a, um, a point where you relate to it in a very specific way and you see some resemblance of that in your own life and, and then you sort of wonder what would you do if you were in that situation and that's really what it's about always creating a conversation after the show for you and someone who else has watched the show it's just that's what it's about like it's, it's about conversation not about judgment um again anybody if you're a believer or not believer science doesn't matter it, you'll you could probably get into this and it's quite a quite a contrast from luke cage and yet in both cases the character that you play is conflicted, has some internal tensions to work out. Which of these performances is a bigger stretch for you as a as an actor? Uh, it's hard. I think I think uh, you know Luke Cage is definitely a stretch because I, I didn't have that much in common with him at the time. I was not you know I was thirty pounds lighter. I was like I got to work out a little bit. I was not. Um, I, I didn't even know anything about. The, I didn't know anything about the character. I, I I couldn't. There was not a lot about him that was me except for the fact that I thought we want to approach the character from a more um, a more self-aware, more conscious, um, well thought out character as opposed to the bombastic, you know, uh, um, cliche that the 70s character presented. We wanted to sort of take it away from that and go into a guy who was sort of more thoughtful, you know. Um, he sort of a uh, thought about things before he before he acted. So I think, you know, he wasn't a more hot tempered than the comic books. So we sort of tweaked it a little bit um, to bring it to something that I thought was more relevant to to the viewers today, especially in the climate that we're in. And this character, I feel like, I mean, that was fun and all his action stuff, that was fun, um, bit of a stretch, but I think this character, while it's a stretch, it feels much more um, challenging because we're sort of dealing with, I mean, a guy who looks like me at my age or around about that age that's decided to go on this journey of um, celibacy, essentially. Celibacy, Catholic Church, you know, already you're going, hmm, that's interesting. You know, um, that was very intriguing to me. I was like, what, what makes this guy want to do this? What is he running from? What is he, what was his past? Um, what's the end game here? And you know, he, he hires this um, woman who is not unattractive, which creates this whole di dynamic where you're going, wait a minute, it's just, this, is un this is a bizarre setting and yet still there's nothing happening, but you're thinking that something could happen. It's all these things that are at play that makes this sort of intriguing because you don't know what's gonna happen in, in any, any, any episode from one episode to the next. Um, so I, I, think it's, I think it's really, this is probably more in my wheelhouse as far as things that I really enjoy doing because it's really more of a uh, of a debate. See, because in, in life I'm a contrarian by nature, and I do like to to infuse that into this character David in the um, in the show Evil because at the end of the day he does believe what he believes, but he also invites people's opinions so he can then debate or then sort of take it in and figure out what the truth is. You know, and there's not many people that can listen to someone, take in their opinion, debate and not be upset, but at the same time be, be very adamant about what he wants and agree to disagree. You know, we all argue and fight sometimes about things that we believe in or we shut people down because they have an opinion that does not actually jive with ours because we don't want to actually hear what they have to say because we're afraid we might actually learn something or might hear something that we actually can't quite um, disprove. You know, we kind of like want to not be proven wrong and I think he's okay with that. He's comfortable with inviting um, the challenge. So I, I love that about the character. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting performance, and especially after Luke Cage sort of sets you up as, you know, this kind of, you know, man of action type yeah. role, and now it's more, uh, more in your head. So that's uh, yeah. very cool. Let's take a couple of questions. Uh, first up here, sir. Hey, Mike. My name's Chris, and I'm an uh, educator over in one of the uh, site when one of the largest Section 8 housing, uh, 
Howard's districts in the state of Minnesota. Uh -huh. Your role was very important, especially, especially to my students of color. As soon as your show came out, they all wanted to start talking to me about it, and I'm a huge comic book nerd, so I'm oh, really, I, I, I know your work well. <laughs> um, what would you say for me as a white educator who does, has not faced some of the challenges that most of my students have gone through would be the most important thing that I could do to inspire these kids to let them know that they may be successful even in a system that's so against them today? Um, it's, it's unique that you would ask me that question. So I grew up in South Carolina, which is, you know, to, to make a long story short, it's not the most liberal place in the world, you know? <laughs> um, and, and I actually don't even, to be quite honest, I don't know where most of this, you know, um, this state stands. I, I, I don't do a lot of um, obsessing about the state because I think I think sometimes we are in states and places that represent us but not necessarily represent every individual in the state so everybody has their own opinion but growing up in South Carolina it, it would be you'd think that the south not necessarily the deep south but deep enough where my experience would be a very specific experience that might be um, stereotypically negative I, I was lucky um, I gotta tell you so I went to a school that was probably mm, 60 percent 60% black, maybe. So there was about half and half. Um, and my educator or my professor or teachers, uh, counselors, most of them are white. About half and half, I'd say. I wouldn't I'd say half and half again. But I was encouraged by the white teachers as much as I was encouraged by the, by the black teachers. And I would say the white teachers, if you, if you think about your position, all you can do is come from a place of authenticity. You know, it, it, you seem like a person that understands, you know, the human condition. You seem to, per to be like a person who cares. If you listen, I think that goes a very long way. You know, I think a lot of times people, you know, uh, I have kids in school. What I don't like about teachers is sometimes you try to talk to them or you try to express your opinion. They are waiting to try to jump in and say something before you can actually say what you have to say because you, you really just want to be heard. And I think when they come to you and, and if you hear them, that's the first step. Um, encouraging them to, to never get down on themselves, encouraging them to, to be honest with them. You know, the, the all honest truth is that they probably have to work harder than most people to get where they want to go. But you, you have to tell them that. You have to be honest. It's, it's not a fair world. You have to work a little harder. They have to um, do things a, a certain way um, because we're trying to work for equality, but we're not there yet. And so while the world is unfair and unjust, we still have to kind of find a way to function. So while you, we are aware and we sympathize, you have to also make sure that they're they well equipped as a teacher to go out and succeed. So, you know, get an education, stay in the path of school. You know, there's no shortcuts. You know, if they, if they want to succeed, they're going to have to just work for it. And, and as much as they find roadblocks, they have to use those roadblocks and create a chip on their shoulder so they can over overwhelmingly overcome those odds. Most people who are successful, they have a lot of obstacles and they take that and use it as fuel to get, you know, to, to get to the next level. I didn't have a lot of people telling me no in going up in school and I li literally had most of my teachers supporting me so I had to kind of create my own edge. Like, you know, it, nobody was telling me no so it was really weird. I mean, I finally found adversity in the real world. You know, I was like, oh my God, wait a minute, this is not gonna be as easy as I thought it was. And I nearly flunked out of my graduate program because I finally found some adversity. Yeah. I, I, it, was, it, it was late in life. So you have to sort of tell them to use that fuel, use that. You can, you can encourage them, but the world is probably not. So use the fuel and, and, and work harder. You know, use that as fuel and, 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 and a, a reason to keep trying. You know, make, it, it's, it's gonna be tough out there, but use it, you know? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, you guys kind of already touched on having to change the emotional uh, and mental aspect of your role in Luke Cage. Was there any episodes or scenes that were particularly difficult for you? You know, a lot of, uh, you know, I'd say the most difficult scenes were the ones where, you know, um, I guess, you know, we, I guess the most difficult thing about Luke Cage is that we, we were challenged with being the first of the black superheroes in the recent years to come out. And we were, I think, tasked with doing so much, you know, but yet still trying to be specifically unique to what we were trying to do, the experience. But it's a lot of pressure, I think. I didn't feel it because I honestly, I just kind of, you know, put blinders on and I don't think about things 
from that perspective because as an artist, whatever you're tasked with, you've got to kind of go in a bubble because everybody's got an opinion about what the character should be, what the world should be, what the story and narrative should be. So I think the hardest part about Luke Cage was just trying to embody the character with a, a certain um, authenticity and realness that, because he's, it's a comic book character. You know, there's a certain amount of, um, they played a little bit of an homage to a lot of the stuff, the classics. A lot of the, the language sometimes the creator would put some of that in there, a flair of that, a flair of that black exploitation in it. Um, trying to serve all of these things at once and still be a grounded TV series that comes across as real is very difficult. I mean, the guy's bouncing bullets off of him. He's throwing people through the wall in some scenes and he's talking to an, uh, a young black kid about something completely historical and something relevant to his own life. I think the hardest part about was trying to just play all that straight and make sure that it made sense. Um, it, it was a very um, unusual task. Um, so I, I can't say there was one specific thing, but trying to keep maintain the tone of a show and, and make sure it's consistent it, when, when you have all these different things you're trying to accomplish in one, you know? I think by the time we got to the second season, we really found a little bit of a footing and really sort of found the world of the show. And it's a shame we didn't get a third season. I think that was going to be where we really told, finished telling the story we wanted to tell. Um, but we left people intrigued and wanting more, so that was good. Thank you very much. And Thanks. A quick quick follow-up on that one. So when Luke Cage debuted the character in Jessica Jones, was the character arc and the story of where he was going already fleshed out in the minds of the producers and the writers such that they could communicate that to you? Or did, that, did, did the character and the story and the performance evolve as just sort of opportunistically as like, okay, well now we're gonna do a whole Luke Cage series? You know, okay, so oddly enough, when I got the, the role and it was uh, the character first appeared in Jessica Jones, they hadn't yet found the creator or the writer for showrunner for Luke Cage. So M Melissa Rosenberg, who wrote Jessica Jones, was going to be the first writer to sort of create Luke Cage. So what her idea and her world and writing style was not going to necessarily be the same writing style for the person they hadn't even found yet. They haven't hired this person yet. Uh, Cheo Hadari Coker was completely a completely different person and writer than Melissa is. So doing Jessica Jones, it was still sort of a um, we will see kind of thing because we had planned to have Luke Cage come last. Iron Fist was supposed to come third. And what ended up happening is that Luke Cage came out like gangbusters and, and, and it was very, it, it came out and hit, you know, hit a chord. And as far as being on Jessica Jones, it, it sparked, it, the character, it, was, it felt right that they would just go in from Jessica Jones to Luke Cage because you had already been introduced to them. It, I don't think it mattered. I think it would have been fine either way, but they felt like, because they hadn't also found, the sh then they hadn't found a showrunner for, for Iron Fist and they hadn't cast the actor. So it just made sense to do it this way. Um, but there was a little bit of we'll see kind of attitude when we were still shooting Jessica Jones because we hadn't even found the, um, the writer yet. So there was, um, I guess, a little pressure, but again, uh, you know, you got to find a way to like just, you know, just focus and not think about what could possibly happen because if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But we, we had no real conclusions about what the character was supposed to be. We were going one episode at a time and then Cheo came in with another completely different idea and then this is what happened, so. Hi, uh, my question actually just got asked, so yeah. thank you oh, for that answer. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess instead, uh, I kind of want to ask, uh, me and my wife have fallen in love with evil, watching it religiously every week. All good, no man. Unintended, I'm religiously. Um, <laughs> she's actually really mad when she has to wait until Sunday to watch it. Cause oh, left yeah. On Thursday. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, uh, I guess the question I have for you is, do you, um, uh, leaving religion out of it, do you have uh, any paranormal experiences that kind of led to the uh, movie, or do you have personal beliefs on paranormal experience? You know, it, it's interesting. So when I read the pilot for Evil, the this pilot was supposed to shoot in New Orleans, which would have been really cool, I think. Um, now looking back in hindsight, I'm kind of glad it didn't because if you know New Orleans, you also know that there's a lot of drinking, a lot of dive bars, a lot of great food, a lot of easy reasons to get in trouble. And I thought if we shot a series there. I don't think it would have turned out the same way because I think the crew would have been <laughs> Probably not showing up for work some days. I think I think <laughs> I, I would have probably been a little fatter than you know, like ten pounds at least. I, I would have gained some some serious weight just from eating the food and stuff. And I think it would have been more difficult to sort of stay focused, even though. Look, shooting in New York City, New York City is a phenomenal city that never sleeps. But there's something about New Orleans I think that you know just begs you to party a little bit more. Um, but New Orleans has that feel. When I when I think there's a sort of um, feel that with the show. 
Um, when I grew up in South Carolina, there's a little bit of a, you know, from the islands, there's this hint of, of, of rich craft, voodoo, things of that nature. When I grew up, there was a moment when I was probably about eight or nine or 10 years old, somewhere in there, I used to sleep and then there was, you see, I used to have this experience where there was someone, it felt like someone was on my chest and I couldn't get up and I couldn't open my eyes and I was struggling to, to, like, to like sit up. And, and I would have this experience from time to time and, and, I, and I would tell my mom about it. And my mom said that was, she said it was the hag riding you, you know? This is, this is what she would say. And it was just some, you know, I guess, old wives tale where, but I, it, it seemed to be believable to me because she said there's a spirit, there's something unsettling with you. There was a woman that lived across the street and I was afraid of her. She, I called her a witch. I would, I would see her but not ever go near her. I would see her walking around her yard. Her lights would always be up in the house. She would never come out during the daytime. Um, and her, she would have these, the grass growing up around the house. Like it was, like, we would think the house was abandoned, but someone was living there. It just was creepy as I don't know what. And people knew her, but I, I, as a little kid, I mean, to me, that was, she was the creepiest person I ever met. She said, because you talk about her, she comes and visits you at night, and she's, and she's not going to stop until you start. <laughs> and it really messed me up. I gotta tell you, it messed me up. <laughs> and um, eventually, I made my peace with that, and, 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 she, and she finally left me alone, so. <laughs> Tell a kid with nightmares something even creepier than the nightmares to make them feel better. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, kind of like <laughs> night terrors from the evil. It's kind of like night terrors, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Just one comment from my wife. She didn't want me to tell you that your voice is like smooth chocolate butter. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's using his wife. It's, he, means he thinks my voice is like smooth chocolate butter. <laughs> How is she wrong? She's not wrong. <laughs> She's not wrong. Um, to kind of, he, he kind of stole my question, so we'll cap on that with, with evil. Um, we were talking to you earlier about how we've also fallen in love with the show, mm -hmm. and that it does touch upon some hairy subjects, yeah. some controversial, some freaky, and some that kind of challenge you. So as an actor, do you yourself have any, or have you developed any boundaries when it comes to subject matter that you personally do not want to cross or to delve in? Or are you able to, as an artist, divorce your personal feelings about a subject matter, whether it's an episode or whether you're, you're given a script, and you can go, you know what, for the sake of the character, I'm okay getting into this subject matter. That's a really interesting question. I, I, I think I, I think I've, I, I wrestle with that one, um, not on a day-to-day -day basis because I don't have to, but there are projects that I look at or read or come into contact with or hear about, and sometimes it, it, there's a visceral reaction where I realize that I'm, I don't want to do that kind of, I don't want to do that, you know, and it's, it's not often um, because I, I think what happens, um, the longer you've been in the business or the older you, you get, some things aren't worth exploring sometimes as an artist because sometimes you look at it and you go, is what I'm doing serving anyone, myself, the world? What am, what's the story that I'm telling? What am I doing to sort of, I don't know. It's Because it's, what we do as storytellers, we have to sort of take some responsibility for. Um, and in the world today, it's very difficult to just divorce yourself from everything and to say, whatever I do on screen, it doesn't represent me, da, 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 da. And I, I, I love the fact that some artists do that and they have no repercussions, no conscience, and that's fine. Some of them go and live on the streets for an, a, a month and a half and don't talk to their, their, their families. I don't know, they do anything they, anything they can to get in the character, method actors, they do all kinds of stuff. And I applaud that as an artist. I, I don't know, there's some things that I, I'm not interested in that don't, you know, don't, they don't hit me in a way that I care to explore because sometimes the images that you put on TV or the images that you put in movies, you have to understand that sometimes it just influences people in a negative way and it, and it doesn't serve anyone. So I, I try to find characters that I can still enjoy, still, they can be gray, they can be sort of in the middle somewhere. Um, this movie, Black and Blue, that I did, um, that's in the theaters now, it, it's, you know, it's a departure from stuff that I, that I did and you probably look at the character and go, well, he's a bad guy, but he's actually kind of a bad guy that sort of ends up sort of being on the side of good from the standpoint of the p point of view of the audience once you watch it. Um, I took the role without reading the script because the director, I worked with him before, and the subject matter was something that I was interested in. It was about policemen and, you know, corruption, and but being the, the center of the, of the, the center character was a female cop who was the hero of the, of the film. Um, 
and it was a departure for me. So because even though this guy was a sort of a, a I guess, a criminal or had a criminal element to him, he was somebody who you did, would not mess with. He wasn't, he's the kind of guy I wouldn't hang out with. He's the kind of guy that he's violent. There was something about him that I could identify with and that he served a story and also he gave you a, a real connection because he was there for the community, not necessarily in the right kind of way, but he was—he had a good intentions. So you have to figure out all these things when you're playing characters because at the end of the day, you know, I don't—I don't want to go to work and feel like what I'm doing is doesn't make sense and doesn't serve a purpose. Um, so I deal with that almost on a project-to-project -project basis. It's hard to just give a blanket statement and go, "I don't want to do this." You know what I mean? You know, there's a lot. Of, I, I say to myself, like, ah, I don't want to play a slave, right? I, I'll say that. I'll say I don't want to play, want to play a slave. But I, I, there, there may have later come a script that I, I go, well, the story is so compelling. So I, while I while I think these things, I have to just give room for the possibility that some wonderful story comes along that is so unique and so different that maybe it changes my perspective and maybe inspires me to, to want to do that. But you know, it's really a, a project by project basis. Oh, hi, Mike. My name is uh, Pierre Young, and um, I really love, I just want to say I really love Luke Cage, and it make, makes me strong as an African-American. Um, so what would be your favorite uh, Luke Cage moment from the series? I always say the same thing. I'm trying to think about it, because I always say Method Man, you know, Bodega. I always, I, it kind of <laughs> pops up because, you know, it just feels like, you know, it feels like a slice of life and a little bit of um, my childhood, you know, or, or college years um, growing up. But I guess... Um, if I guess I could think about maybe the mashup between me and uh, I think um, was it uh, Bushmaster? Us, we were fighting a, a bunch of people in this factory. Like I, I kind of like the sequence a lot, and I love the, the you know sometimes fight sequences. Now that I don't do them as much, and I don't have you know because when I was doing them, I was like, oh, I was so sick of these fight sequences. They're so hard, <laughs> so tired of just you know just work. This is just grinding, you know. Um, now that I look back on it, I think about you know the, the fight scene sequence between uh, when Iron Fist and I first met, then the one we had together when he was you know we did the patty cake and stuff, and you know it was kind of cool, you know, just like you look back on it now and you go, oh, that was kind of cool. That was a really cool sequence, you know, and um, I think about those moments because that kind of is sort of a storytelling vehicle for the show. Sometimes those action sequences, those fight sequences, are they're, they're, it's chemistry, you know. It's like it's like does does it work? Do these do these two people do do they do they jive? Do they mesh together? And it tells it tells a whole thing that maybe sometimes words can't tell. So that that fight sequence sort of uh, it was very important. Felt good. So, so no big fight sequences coming up in Evil. <laughs> no, no fight sequences. But some, there there is some there is uh, there is some action coming up. But I can't give it away. It's 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 this farther to see farther in the in the uh, uh, season. So I don't want to give anything away on that one. Fair enough. Something to look forward to. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Leah. Was there ever a scene in Luke Cage that they took out that made you really agitated? You know, yeah, there was there was once a yeah. You know what? Uh, once there was a scene where what was it? I for, I forgot it. I'm trying to think exactly what it was. Okay, I was on the run and I can't remember what. I think it was I'd been framed for. Or hurting a hurting a cop or something like that. Luke Cage and he was on the run, and he got uh, uh, cornered by these cops. And something about the way they shot it and 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 the, and the way it transpired and unfolded. I had I had a problem with the way it, the, the the script called for this to work. This did, it didn't it didn't make sense to me the way they wrote it. Um, and a lot of times it's just because you know we're we're we have to. How do I say this? When you're telling stories and you're trying to be honest sometimes, and this goes back to like even like, you know, a story like Black and Blue, sometimes the role of the artist is just to sort of tell the stories that we all experience and not necessarily to play favoritism or to try to candy coat it. Just give, you, give it to you straight, you know, like literally like you saw it, you read it, you see it on the news. Like literally we just want to give you a, what, a straight shot of what we see and that's it. We don't want to, we don't want to, you know, be beholden to the politics. We just want to say what it is. And sometimes I think we get we get um, restrained by that because at the end of the day, there's so many parts to show business because it is a business. You know, um, the show business is literally changed in the last, oh man, I'd say 15, 20 years to a point where there's so many cooks in the kitchen, as I like to say. There's so many people who are involved in the decision making of what gets on the screen and the stories that are told based off of um, um, 
contracts, based off of product placement, based off of um, alliances, based off of friend partnerships, that is all business, that you can't even tell the story you want to tell because somebody goes, ah, 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 we don't want to say that because that might make so-and-so upset. Okay, okay, you got to take that part out. Ah, 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 that doesn't quite, so you're dealing with all of that. You put a script in, they're not even looking at the story. They're looking to see what is offensive and what has, you know, it's a very, very political thing. So I think a lot of times we bumped into that and I think it prevented us from telling some even better stories. But, you know, we did the best we could and I think um, it came out pretty well considering it's, you know, we were telling stories from a comic book standpoint. Thank you. Hey. Hi. I have a question about um, an episode of Evil that really disturbed me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It um, was the episode with um, the young boy, and he was trying to kill his family. Yeah. And I once wondered, what was your reaction when you first read the ending of that story? Oh, I was, I was disturbed as anybody who watched it. You know, when I first read it, I go, wow, this is really dark. This is like, I, I, was, I read it, and it made me uncomfortable. And, I, but as an, as an artist, as an actor, I was like really inspired to, to want to, to, to tell the story, but at the same time, I felt a part of me as a parent, as a person, that felt uncomfortable about this, this story a little bit. But it wasn't as if this stuff doesn't happen in life. It, it, this stuff is, you know, we're not dealing with something that is unheard of. It's just that sometimes we shy away and we look away because it's not comfortable for anyone. I mean, nobody wants to think about that because it's so, you know, to, to have something like that happening in your own home and to not know how to deal with it, it's very uncomfortable. And, um, it, it, I'm, I'm, I applaud the first, first of all, the Kings for writing it or for having this, this story being told. And I, I applaud CBS for allowing us to sort of try to, you know, go in these places and we continue to try to push it every, every episode, the season, we sort of try and find ways to tell a, a more unique story and push some boundaries of what network television is known for. So I was really disturbed by reading it. Um, I, I can't, I, the, we shot some scenes during the daytime, I, I was really disturbed. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm, I was like literally going, ooh, this episode. I was waiting to see what the reaction would be. And, um, but you, you know, I was, it's just, it's just art sometimes. You really wanna try and get it as right as possible. And I think sometimes it's making you think. And that's really all we can do is make you think, which is what you're still doing right now. You're still thinking about that episode, which is the, the whole point. Um, what, can I, what can we do? I don't know. Um, what the mother did, I don't, you know, you know it's, just, it's a lot of questions. I don't know. But I'm glad, you, I'm glad it made you think. It's st I'm still thinking about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think the people will be thinking about it come awards time, too. That was a very powerful uh, well, episode of television. Yeah. That, was, that was very well done. All right. All right, Mike. I got my question on my phone because I'm probably going to mess this up. Um, I just, I'm a huge fan of your work as Luke Cage. Uh, my name's Jared, by the way. Hey, um, and kind of how you managed to embody this, like, bulletproof badass, but you also managed to show real emotions, like his work with the other characters and pops. Um, anyways, uh, you kind of touched on it early, but in prep for your role as Luke Cage, what was your uh, workout routine like, or did you have one at all? <laughs> you, you know, it was funny. I, I, I look back on it, I wish I'd hired a trainer, like somebody to just, you know, just kick my butt and sort of like just be on me. But I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the truth, you know, this is, I, I don't, I don't love trainers, not because they don't know what they're doing. It's because, you know, I'm a very sort of, I'm, I'm a little bit of a private person sometimes. You know, I just got an Instagram account a little over a year ago, and now, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still trying to figure out sometimes, sometimes I post, sometimes I don't know things I want to leave alone. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a private person, so when I first got this role, I, I got to tell you, you know, everybody wants to train somebody that's going to be a superhero. It's like, oh, you know, it's, I didn't really want to open my world up to another person who was going to have to, I was going to see three times a week, four times a week to have to deal with this all of a sudden new best buddy. You know, I mean, you're literally hiring a best buddy because he's going to be in your face every week. He's going to be, you know, calling you, texting you, checking your nutrition. I just didn't want to deal with it. So I said, you know what? I, I used to work out a lot and then I, I stopped. Um, and then I, ju I just sort of did it myself. I, I read books, I, you know, I did the best I could and I put the weight on, I needed, I, I, I put on about 30, 35 pounds. And then I just said, you know what? I, and I, I worked as hard as I could. I took the supplements and I did the regimen and it worked out okay, you know, but I, I, it was no real, I, I'll say there's no real hard rule that what I did, I ate a lot more. I, I had about two or three protein shakes a day. I worked out at least four times a week. Um, I upped my, up my uh, the, the, the weight, you know, every time I was working out. Um, and, I, and, I, and I 
got rest, which is what you have to do, which is a, this is the hardest part of it, getting rest to repair the muscles. It's, it's, very, it's very boring stuff, but that's what I did. And once I achieved it, I was like, okay, now I gotta maintain this, which is so difficult because you're watching a TV show, you can't just, you know, it's not a movie, so you gotta continuously do it because you got another season coming up. That was the hardest part about it. Like, I didn't, I didn't wanna eat anymore, and I was tired of working out, and I was like, this is really annoying, you know? So um, that's why I'm kind of glad to do something else for a change, you know? Yeah. Thank you. So I just got the 10 minute sign. So if we uh, go and switch into lightning round mode here, I think we can get everybody that's All in right. line now. For fast, questions. fast, fast questions, fast answers. Thank you. Um, what is your love? Where is your happy place? When Mike has time for Mike, yep. how do you, what makes your soul giggle and how do you keep it polished and shiny, especially with the amount of darkness that you deal with? Um, Honestly, it's uh, it's my kids, my kids. Aww. Yeah, yeah, I got I got two daughters, <laughs> and I, I I you know I work a lot, and so my youngest is a one year old who is always giggling and smiling, and and I think personality sometimes is, is starts early on, and for some reason she looks like she's gonna be a comedian. I mean, she's always giggling. I'm like, kids not never in a bad mood. Wakes up in a good mood, goes to sleep in a good mood, eats in a good mood. I, there's, I mean, even if she skips a nap, she's still in a good mood. Not, I, I don't know. So I look at that, and, it's, and it makes me happy. I also, my hammock, I, I used to have a hammock that I love. I love laying in a hammock. Hammocks are great. Um, great. Uh, it's like, because you're like a grown man being held by someone. It's like a, like a baby. <laughs> you know? I love hammocks. They're so much fun. Um, so much fun. And then, you know, I also like going and taking trips with... with um, with, with loved ones and sort of just, you know, sharing a little time, you know, a little escape, a little escape time, you know, that's good. You know, getting, getting away, doing stuff, you know, just normal stuff, having coffee in the morning, you know, taking strolls, you know, seeing new places, you know what I mean? You know, I, I like to travel sometimes for leisure, so it's good. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's good. Thank you. Hello, my wife tried to break her uh, ankle on Thursday, so she sent me up with her question. Wow. Um, what is it like working with kids considering the controversial nature of the show Evil? I gotta tell you, we got a heck of a great group of kids in that show. If you haven't seen the show, please watch it. You know, what, what's another great thing about the show, so the Kings are really good at what you, what you would call A stories, B stories, C stories. Sometimes it's a D story. They have so many different things going on in one episode, and they're all substantially uh, of substance and good. Like, like, we have kids on the show. When I first started the show, the, the lead character who I work with, her, she has four children on the show. And you go, four children? What's going on, four children? You know, it's not a kid's show. So you're going, how are we going to use these kids? These kids are so effortless. They come in. You think they actually are sisters. They're all girls. Um, we have some of, the, some of the weirdest, creepiest, darkest, disturbing things are in their storyline. And, and, you know, again, this is, a, this is a, a very mature show, but there's something for everybody in the show, i got to tell you. I mean, I, I, the, I think the Halloween episode freaked me out. You know, and I'm going, I read that, I'm going, man, I wish I could, I wish everybody, because I don't want to give a spoiler, but some of their stuff is really good and really interesting, and I, I love work with them. I mean, they're, they're just really great. I mean, yes, they change the way you can shoot because of the hours and how much you can work them, but other than that, you know, they, they force us to work on a couple Saturdays, which I did not like, um, but uh, other than that, you know, it's pretty good. So check the show out. These, these, these child actors are great, and we have another episode coming up with some girls. Uh, it's so good. Just have, check it have, out. Have you played any scenes with them yet? No, no but uh, it's a reason for it. I, I th at least I think there is. It's a, it, it'll, it'll, you know, move us too far forward. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> yes, um, who did you look up to when you were younger and why? Um, looked up to a lot of people. Like I think everybody has a hero or somebody in a certain uh, field that, whether it's a sports person or whatever. Um, you know, but I, I really did look up to my parents. I was lucky. Not everybody has that option. And my parents weren't like exceptionally well accomplished in any certain field. But I gotta tell you, you know, and now as a parent, I gotta tell you what the most important thing as a parent is really just sort of um, being there, you know, like being there. Like I think, I think, I think people forget. Like you gotta show up to work. You gotta show up as a parent too. Um, my, I, I had two parents. Um, my dad graduated from the sixth grade. He was not a person who stayed in school long because his, his dad passed away early, so he had to sort of become the man of the family. And my mom was a senior in high school. She graduated from high school. And both of them were blue collar workers who worked in factories and things of that nature. But all of them made sure that we all went to school. Everybody went and got a degree in something. Um, that's 
that's something that people don't re think about. I think when you, when you look as a parent, you want your kids to be a little better than you are. And whatever that means, you want them to go a little farther than you did. It's not a competition between you. You always want to set your kids up for success but and, and challenge them. And I think that's what their whole thing was. And they didn't put a lot of pressure on us, but they made sure that we understood that the only way we were going to get anywhere was to, like, to have an education, you know? And I know it's hard because in this country, you got to pay for it, which sucks. Um, I was, I, I, I signed on to, you know, to get in debt. And I did that happily because I, I, I was gambling on my own success. I was so happy that somebody would allow me to put, put my, my name on the line to get into huge amounts of debt to try this stupid thing called acting. That's really what I was trying. I'm like, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to, you know, sign. and honestly, we shouldn't have to do that in this country. We should not have to do that. And, and luckily, it, no, we shouldn't. Luckily, it's worked out for me, but um, always gamble on yourself. And if you can't afford to go to college and you don't want to get in debt, just, just find something. Go, go into apprenticeship. Find something. Always, always learn something. Find out whatever you want to do. And you don't have to go to path of school. Find out some place you can be an apprentice, an assistant. Find someone who knows what they're doing in the field you want to be in and listen to them and learn. There's so many successful people in this world who didn't go to school, but they put themselves in a place to, of, um, to succeed because they, they're smart enough to understand that they have to learn from someone. So just, you know, pick somebody and follow them around and, you know, and suck their brain and get all this juice and all this knowledge, you know? Thank you. Hey there. Um, Luke Cage had a fantastic soundtrack. Oh, yeah. It was one of those things that just got that and got, got you pumping. And one of my favorite scenes is when you're, you put on the headphones and you just go into beating up drug dealers. I love oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was good. <laughs> uh, it seemed like it really impacted how he did things. And I was wondering what, what kind of music you liked and if that was something that impacted your life at all. Um, you, yeah, I, I, I listen to a lot of music, um, and I have to remind myself sometimes that sometimes the music you listen to is really influencing you subconsciously. You know, people don't understand the power of music. You know, music is very important in your life, and it plays an integral part in how you see the world. It, could, it totally influenced your mood. So the music was always selected for the show based off of, you know, what the mood was, the scene. We had a composer, Adrian Young and, and Ali Fashid Muhammad, um, um, who were composing music they were they were artists and I, I I like to listen to so many different types of music music but um I, I can't say I have a genre when it comes to I mean rap is rap has changed today I, I'll say you know most of the rap you listen to on the radio I feel like there's an agenda sometimes the rap is just I, I'll, I'll be frank it's garbage I'll be frank I'll be and listen I, I'm not I'm not knocking the artists I love a lot of the beats the beats are great but the message, the lyrics are god awful. And I'm not saying it's not inventive, it's not creative, but it's just the same thing that's sort of being ingrained and beaten to your head all the time about negative stereotypes. And I feel like, you know, the good, some of the, some of the really positive artists out there, because hip hop is, is very popular. And I feel like some of the good positive artists, they don't get any airplay, they don't get any radio play. And I, and I feel like, you know, you have to seek them out. You know, people like Chance the Rapper, you know, people like Lupe Fiasco, you know, you have to, you have to seek them out. Because they don't get the same attention, you know. Um, you know that that song, you know, Childish Gambino came out with, you know, "This Is America." They let it come through because I, I feel like it was it was it was lightning in a bottle and it was so phenomenal. But we don't get a lot of what they call conscious rap, conscious hip hop. Um, so I, I like a lot of different music genres, but um, I wish I could get a little more of that. You know. Thank you. Final question. No pressure. So at the end of season three, um, Luke Cage sort of became the new kingpin mob boss of Harlem. Uh, unfortunately, you know, season three, you know, probably not going to happen. So unfortunately, uh, we're all sad about that one. Um, so what do you think season three would have entailed for Luke Cage becoming the new kingpin of Harlem? I think the journey, I think the direction he, we were going, and, um, and I got, I, I got, honestly, I got six episodes uh, in my emails. I could open up and read them all, to, you know, but I never did because, I, you know, once we found out we weren't shooting, I didn't want to know. You know, yeah. I talked to the, the showrunner about it prior to, I knew the direction we were going in, and Luke was gonna, he was gonna go dark for a bit. And I think he was going to do things the way he thought it needed to be done to get things done. And I think we were gonna try to, what I would like to say, um, how to describe it, to spin some of that goodwill that he had built up for over the years as a, as a Boy Scout and a good guy, we we're gonna sort of stretch that a bit. Um, I guess the most thing I can liken it to and this is not a great analogy, but remember the Superman where Superman went bad for a bit? 
It was Superman, like, what was that, three? What was that, episode three, I was, I was, uh, three I think it was? Like, it, it was a departure, and you go, wait a minute, that's weird, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you get sick of being nice, and I think he was going to do that for a bit. I think he was going to try to be a, a kingpin for a bit, be to be a, a guy who, you know, lived in a nightlife a little bit and, and used his powers the way he wanted to use them. But I think, ultimately, his conscience and the community would have pulled him back into the, the place we left him. Um, but the journey to get back to that would have been so much more fun um, had we got a chance that third season to tell that story. Right on. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yep. Anybody, anybody think that uh, Luke Cage might have a future in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Would anybody, would anybody go see that movie? Mike, if uh, Kevin Feige called, would you, uh, would you take that call? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Kevin Feige knows they're doing some great things in the cinema universe. And if he calls, great. And if not, uh, I appreciate the opportunity that I had. And uh, good luck to the next